In this video, I'm going to go over some common symbols that you might encounter when dealing with electrical circuits. So the first symbol that you need to be familiar with is a battery. So this is the positive terminal of the battery, and this is the negative terminal of a battery. Now let's connect it across a resistor. So that's the schematic for a resistor. Keep in mind that current flows from the positive terminal towards the negative terminal. So in this case, current is flowing in the clockwise direction. So that's the definition for conventional current. That's the flow for it. Electrons flow in the opposite direction. And keep in mind, for a metal, electrons are the charge carriers. Now sometimes you might have multiple batteries connected to increase the voltage. So if you see this, it just means that there's many batteries connected. So let's say if each battery is 3 volts and there's 2 batteries, the total voltage is 6 volts. So that's how you connect 2 batteries in series to increase the voltage. Now if you connect 2 batteries, let's say in parallel, then the current that can be delivered will be increased. So let's say if this battery delivers 10 amps of current and this one can also deliver 10 amps of current. At this junction, the total current will be 20 amps. So whenever you connect batteries in series, I mean in parallel, this is a parallel connection, you can increase the current that they can deliver. If you connect batteries in series, like in the last example, you can increase the voltage. Now let's talk about resistors. To connect two resistors in series, you can do it like that. Let's call this R1 and R2. Now the total resistance for two resistors in series is simply the sum of these two resistors. It's R1 plus R2. Now if you connect two resistors, let's say in parallel, let's call this R1 and R2, the total resistance or the equivalent resistance is, you could say 1 over RT is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Now sometimes you may have more than two resistors in parallel. So let's say if there's three resistors connected in parallel, R1, R2, R3. So then you have this equation, 1 over RT is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 and then plus 1 over R3. Now if you have three resistors in series, the total resistance is simply the direct sum of those three resistors. So how can you distinguish if a circuit is in series or if it's in parallel? In a series circuit, the current is the same. Notice that there's a single path for the current to flow. There's only one path. Now, in a parallel circuit, there's multiple paths for the current to flow. So the current can flow in this path it can also take this path, or it can take that path. And so whenever you have multiple paths for the current to flow, you have a parallel circuit. In a series circuit, there's only one path for the current to flow. Now let's talk about switches. This is an open switch. If the circuit is open, no current can flow. And then this is a closed switch. When the switch is closed, current can flow through the circuit. Now some other symbols that you need to be familiar with is a ground. So that's a symbol for that. This is simply a wire. And let's say if you have a motor in a circuit, you can write M for a motor. A motor is the device that converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. And if you spin it yourself, you can convert mechanical energy into electrical energy. Now, there are some other symbols that you need to be familiar with. The next one is a capacitor. So this is just a regular capacitor, nothing special about it. And the symbol for that is C. It's measured in farads. So sometimes you may have a 100 microfarad capacitor or a 10 farad supercapacitor. 
The next symbol you need to be familiar with is an electrolytic capacitor. If you see this, this side is positive and the other side is negative. So it's just a polarized capacitor. The next symbol we need to talk about is the inductor. Electricity can easily flow through an inductor. Direct current flows easily through it, but an inductor resists alternating current. So anytime the current is changing, the inductor will oppose that change. A capacitor doesn't allow direct current to flow. In fact, there is an insulator inside a capacitor. So DC current does not flow through a capacitor. However, a capacitor is used to store electrical energy. Now, a capacitor does pass AC current. No current flows in between, but because alternating current constantly charges and discharges the capacitor, it appears as if it allows AC current to flow. Now, let's talk about lamps and light bulbs. There's a lot of different ways that you can draw the symbol for a lamp or a light bulb. So one way you can write it like this. That's a simple way to draw the symbol for a light bulb. I've seen this symbol. Let me do that again. And perhaps you've seen something that looks like this. That's another a symbol for a lamp. Or you could do it the old fashioned way and actually just draw a light bulb with a circuit attached to it. And you could show the light coming off. Everyone should understand that that's a light bulb. Now let's talk about the diode. So here we have a regular diode and this is the positive terminal of the diode and this is the negative terminal of a diode. So this is called the anode and this is the cathode of a diode. So what a diode does is it allows current to flow in one direction. So electricity can only flow in this direction. So let's say if you have an alternating current, which can flow in both directions. So it can flow in this direction, and it can flow in that direction. Well, if you connect a diode in series with an AC source, the diode will only allow current to flow in this direction. Now I'm speaking of conventional current, that's the flow of positive charge even though electrons are really flowing in this direction. So just keep that in mind. So it's not going to allow current to flow in this direction. It only allows current to flow in this direction. That is from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So a diode can be used to convert alternating current into direct current. Now granted, if you draw the graph, this is going to be the graph for the AC sine wave. It's going to look like that. And so what the diode is going to do is going to take out half of this graph. So this part is going to disappear. And so you have basically DC current, but it's not exactly, it's not like this. It's not completely rectified. It's a variable DC current. So you may have to add some other circuit elements if you want a pure DC current. But diodes are used to rectify an AC current into a DC current. Next up, we have the light emitting diode. So like any other diode, this is going to be the anode, and this is the cathode. Now, there's only one key feature that distinguishes this LED from a regular diode, and it's these two arrows. It shows that this diode emits light, so it's a, a light emitting diode, or an LED. Light emitting diodes are very efficient in converting electrical energy into the light energy. They don't generate a lot of heat, whereas an incandescent light bulb converts a lot of the electricity into heat. Let me draw this better. So this is good at making light too, but if you have your house filled with incandescent light bulbs, you'll realize that if you leave it on for a while, your house will get warm. But if you use LEDs, it doesn't generate as much heat, so your house is going to stay cool relatively longer. Now the way an incandescent light bulb works is you have a very thin metal wire called a filament 
which I'm going to draw in gray. And then you connect this to, let's say, a battery. Now this wire is very, very thin. And so when current passes through it, the electrons, they generate a lot of friction due to the motion in that very thin wire. And so they cause the wire to heat up. Now, whenever a metal becomes hot, eventually you could see it turn red. Before it turns red, it's emitting a lot of infrared radiation, but then it turns red. And as it gets hotter, it turns yellow and then white hot. So an incandescent light bulb works by converting electrical energy into heat. However, when the metal is heated up to, let's say a high temperature, maybe like 700, 800, or 900 Celsius, I'm not sure what the exact temperature needs to be, but when it gets very hot, then the metal begins to emit light. In fact, any metal will do that. If you heat up a metal, it will begin to emit light. And so that's how an incandescent light bulb works. It converts electricity into heat, and if the temperature is hot enough, then the metal begins to emit light. Now, let's talk about the solar cell. There's different ways in which you can draw the diagram of solar cell. So this is the symbol for a battery. And just as a battery generates a voltage for a circuit, a solar cell can do the same thing. A battery converts chemical energy into electrical energy, but a solar cell converts light energy into electrical energy. So I'm going to put this in a circle, and then we need to show light coming into the cell. So that's one way in which to describe the symbol for a solar cell. Another way in which you could do it is you can draw a diode, but with light energy coming in as opposed to light energy coming out. So that's another way in which you could represent a solar cell. Now let's talk about the transformer. So this is the symbol for a transformer. Now right now, the right side looks different from the left side. Sometimes they could look the same. So sometimes you could have a transformer that looks like this. Now, if you see it like this, it just means that the right side has more coils than the left side. So let's say if the left side has 100 coils and the right side has 1,000 coils. So going from left to right, this is called a step-up transformer because it can increase the voltage. So let's say if we have a 12-volt signal that is an AC wave with a frequency of 60 hertz, that means that the current alternates direction 60 times in one second. So let's say it's 12 volts and 10 amps. So the power, which is voltage times current, it's 12 times 10, which is 120 watts. Now, because the right side has 10 times more coils than the left side, the voltage is going to increase by a factor of 10. So it's going to go up from 12 volts to 120 volts. Now, this is assuming that the transformer is 100% efficient. Now, granted, nothing is perfect. Energy is typically lost due to friction and other ways of it being lost. So it may be 110 or 115. But in the ideal situation, it should be 120. Now, the current is going to decrease by a factor of 10. So right now, it's 10 amps. But on the right side, it's going to be 1 amp. Now, if we calculate the power on the right side, it's voltage times current, 120 times 1. So the power is still 120 watts. Now, this is in harmony with the law of conservation of energy, which states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So the rate at which energy is being transferred to the left side of the transformer has to equal the rate at which energy is being transferred uh, from the right side. So the power that's absorbed by the transformer on one side must be equal to the power delivered by the transformer on the other side. Now, this only works for an AC signal. As the current alternates, as it's constantly changing direction and in magnitude, it generates a change in magnetic field. And that change in magnetic field is picked up by these coils, which creates an induced EMF. And that generates the voltage that we see on the right side. Now, if you try to send a DC current in this transformer, you're not going to get any signal on the right side. The only time you'll get a signal is when the voltage changes from zero to its 100% value or its maximum value. So for example, 
let's say if this is the DC current and this is the voltage time graph. In reality, it doesn't really look like this because when the switch is off, when there's no electricity flowing through it, the voltage has to be zero. And let's say if you're applying a 12 volt uh, source to it, to a 12 volt DC source, the voltage has to go up from zero to 12. And it does take some time to do that. Now, while the voltage is increasing, there's going to be a signal on the right side. You're going to detect a pulse. Now, once the voltage reaches its maximum and it's no longer changing, then there's going to be no voltage generated on the right side. So the only time you can generate a voltage or current on the right side of a transformer is if the voltage or current is changing on the left side. While it's constant, no energy will be transferred. But while it's increasing or decreasing, there's going to be a transfer of energy. And the rate at which it increases or decreases will be reflected on the right side. So transformers are useful for AC current, but they won't help you if you're using DC current. Now the next thing that we need to talk about is the transistor. There's two common transistors that you need to be familiar with. There's other types, but two common ones that you'll see often. Let me do that again is the NPN transistor. This is the base, this is the emitter, and this is the collector. And also the PNP transistor. The difference between these two transistors is the direction of the arrow. Notice that the arrow points away from the center of the transistor and here it points towards it. So this is a PNP transistor and the other one is an NPN transistor. Now next, you need to be familiar with the electrical symbol of a speaker, which typically looks like that. And then finally, we need to talk about the voltmeter and the ammeter. Now when using the voltmeter, you want to connect it across an element. And so the voltmeter is represented by the symbol V. Now when dealing with an ammeter, you want to connect it in the circuit. So current has to be flowing through the ammeter to measure the current. And to measure the voltage, you need to connect the device or the multimeter across an element. So make sure you understand that whenever you want to measure voltage or current. 